Hey guys, it's Chris. What's up? It's just a Sunday Q&A with Chris, but it's not Sunday, it's Monday. I had a great day here. I'm at, I'm at my club in Vermont, one of my greatest places to be in the world. My own club, that was my dream since I was a little kid to have a club. And we had our homeschool camp today, it went really well. I don't know if any of you guys caught the, the, some of the YouTube videos that we did, but we put up a really, I think a really cool video yesterday from my show where I was on court with some of my players. So I don't know if any of you guys caught that. What's up Enrique? Enrique GM is on live. He's giving me a wave. Felipe Valim. Thank you for watching. Tim Treat, thank you for watching. Stephen Fitzpatrick, an old friend. Thank you for watching, buddy. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Hi. I, I wanted to jump online and answer any tennis questions for you guys. I know some of you have been watching the, the show uh, where I was on court with some of my players, so I wanted to see if anyone had any questions from watching me work on court. I uh, was working with two girls yesterday. One was a tournament player who's about 12, and she's trying to get to the national level. So she's a pretty good player, but she's not national level yet. And the other one was a little young, young girl, eight years old, who's a, kind of a beginner. And I was starting from scratch with her, working on her technique. So I'm just curious if anyone has any questions about the work that I was doing on court. And I'm happy to answer any questions about that or any other tennis development questions. I have, I try to set aside every Sunday night to do a Q&A for coaches and for parents. And that's sort of the whole point of the show, uh, kind of give people access to a serious high performance coach. Maybe you don't have someone who you can, Seth Haley Galicia. I shouted you out. I hope I got the name right. Is it Galicia? Um, thank you for watching. But the idea behind the show is to kind of try to answer tennis questions that any of you guys have. I don't know. Um, you know, I know some people don't have access to like, maybe they're in an area that doesn't have really good coaching or maybe they have a kid who needs help with their game. So I'm just trying to make myself available as a resource for, for parents and for coaches. And, um, you know, especially for parents. I love working with, with parents and helping them with their kids. And I think that's really my, my passion. But also for coaches, I like, I'm, I'm doing a lot of coach education. So if any coaches have any, have any questions, that would be cool too. If not, I'll sign off and I'm going to go watch a movie with my, my son. I think we're going to watch Ant-Man and the Wasp. So if nobody has any coaching questions tonight or parenting questions or tennis development questions, I think I'm going to sign off and go, go watch that film. But yesterday I was working with two girls. I'll stay on a little longer and see if anyone has any technical questions or anything like that. And, uh, one was 12, one was eight. Oh man, I wish I could come to Argentina. Uh, Enrique's asking me if I can come to Argentina. Well, I guess that's a tennis question. I would love that. I actually been meaning to go to Buenos Aires. I hear that all of the best, all the best academies are in Buenos Aires. Is that true? Would you agree with that, Enrique? That, that that's the place to be. And I have some connections through the PTR in Argentina and I know there's a bunch of good academies there and I really would like to get out there and and study in Argentina. I know the style is similar to the Spanish style because they both play on clay and you know there's a lot of emphasis on topspin and grinding and uh, patience and I, I like that and so I, I would really love to get out there. I see my lovely wife is watching, Kim. What's up, Kim? Uh, we had a really good day up here. I miss you. I miss the kids. Uh, Pablo Babiano Martinez is waving at me. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm here to answer any tennis questions. This is a Sunday night program. 
but it's Monday night because last night I was driving up to Vermont with some players from my camp. So I just wanted to get, I want to keep a routine. So I want to know, let everyone to know that next, next Sunday I will be on live for Q&A and hopefully we can build up a big following, a big audience and we can, we can talk tennis and answer any technical development questions you guys might have out there. As word gets out, it'll be a little easier to, to get the, the program rolling. But, yeah, so did any of you guys catch the, the show yesterday? I thought we had, I thought it was really good working with the, the eight-year-old. The eight-year-old was just like learning her f new forehand, new backhand, everything brand new, strokes and everything. And... Uh, also the 12-year-old girl. Today we did a live broadcast and it was mental training. So I was up here at the academy in Vermont. We're in Londonderry, Vermont, like this beautiful town of Londonderry. And my club is here and we were doing a mental training session. And I thought that went pretty well. And we broadcast that live on YouTube. So that's available as well. But it doesn't look like we're going to get a lot of questions tonight. And I, I, I'll just wait a little bit longer, see who's available, see who jumps on. So what I'm doing with some of the girls is um, I'm teaching them a very low, low finish. I don't know if some of you guys caught that, like a very low finish on the forehand and uh, emphasizing topspin on all the strokes. And I think that's going to be kind of controversial because everyone's teaching the follow through to the shoulder. And I'm not teaching that anymore at all. I'm teaching always the, the, the follow through around uh, down by the waist and I'm, we're inverting the finish. But I think that's going to be a big, uh, that's going to be the future for, for the forehand. It's, you know, you're trying to build elasticity, trying to get more of a wrap finish. Um, but I'm, I'm curious if any of you guys saw the, the show yesterday with, with that technique that I was working on. Maru Rodriguez, thank you for waving. Thank you for watching. Where are you guys at? If you're logged on now, tell me where you're from. I'd like to know where, where, where you're coming from. Right now I'm in Vermont at my club, uh, CLTA Vermont. I have a small club here with four courts, hard courts and red clay. And it's like my dream place. I uh, have a summer camp here and I run uh, my academy here. But I live in New York, so I, I drive from uh, about three and a half hours from New York City, and I come up here to my paradise, and I, I run camps and, and coach kids here. But I love it up here. I have some wonderful kids here right now that I'm training for the next couple days, and uh, couldn't be much happier when I'm, when I'm here in my own place. I don't like renting courts anymore. I love teaching at my own club. It's really a great experience that way. Alberto Sanchez Lopez, give me a wave. Thank you very much. Sounds like a Spanish guy. Where are you at? Tell me, tell me where you guys are, are chiming in from. I'd like to see uh, if we got who signed on from around, around the world. And last, last Wake Up Live show that I did, I had had some uh, some guys from Australia, from Philippines. It was really cool that people were learning from my books and from my videos from all around the world. I know a lot of parents are are using those resources and and coaches too. But um, we got a like. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, ben Sterner, what's up, Ben? Give me a wave. It's good to see you, man. I'm doing the Sunday Q&A on Monday, but I haven't got any tennis questions yet. Do you have any tennis questions about your little superstar there? Throw it at me. I know you're going to bring him to me when, when he's a little older and he needs his high-performance training. i got to get him a top college scholarship or something. But if you guys have any uh, tennis questions, sh shoot them out. Development questions, questions about technique, player development, tactics. Did anyone catch our psychology session this afternoon? 
it was a good session. We were talking about body language. We were talking about mental game. It was cool. Let's see. Yeah. Talk about it. Okay. Ben Sterner says, talk about development of kids four to six years old and eye coordination. Hmm. If you've got a four or six year old, you should see the new series by Tony Nadal. So Tony Nadal, uh, you're, Seth Haley Galicia is asking me if I play with Federer. No, I have not played with Roger, but I would love to do that. But getting back to the hand, uh, hand-eye development and, and uh, development for a four to six year old, Tony Nadal has some excellent new uh, he has some like a video series, a coaching course, and a parenting course. You should really look into that, Ben. He's got a number of really good uh, eye and hand racket and ball drills that he does with all his juniors. He has a parenting course, and every video he has a new hand eye coordination racket drill for for young kids. And I think that's what you're getting at. They're all on court. They're all with the racket and ball. So. I thought it was pretty cool. Every video that he does, he introduces a new coordination exercise for the for the hand and for the eye. And he has a lot of different stuff that he does with the racket, like different volley drills and bump ups and bump downs and pretty much a lot of creative drills on court that you can use. So I would, I would point you towards that resource with Tony Nadal. It's called the Mentor Course. Tony Nadal, if you go to... Uh, World Mastery is called World Mastery by with Tony Nadal, and he has it's all online, and you can purchase the uh, the mentor course. The mentor course is really good for parents. He also shares a lot of his wisdom stuff that he did with Rafa when when Rafa was a kid, and he talks about parenting and and junior development. It's a very very good course. I'm taking the course right now. It's actually uh, a certification course for coaches too. So I'm I'm taking this course uh, with Tony. And he's in, he's in Mallorca speaking Spanish, but all of the, all of the course content is, is closed captioned and translated into English so I can follow it really well because my Spanish is, is not super great. Uh, Maria Luisa Bar Barros waving at me. Thank you so much. Where are you guys from? Tell me, tell me where you're, where you're chiming in from. I'd like to see who, where the audience is coming from. But for four to six year olds, man, I like to get them on the court playing tennis as, as much as possible. What, what I don't like is when a lot of the classes for that age, they only focus on, they do like a lot of games and a lot of, uh, you know, agility, coordination exercises, but they don't actually do a lot of swings. Uh, if you remember when I was working with your son, I like to get them swinging a lot and building up strength and actually starting to play as soon as they can and, and really uh, swinging the racket. I don't like when the, the, the young kids and the red ball don't, they, they do a lot of like tossing and like stuff you would see in a, in a physical education class. I really like to get them started with swings, uh, building up strength and learn how to hit the ball and rally and and I think that's, uh, that's kind of the way that I, that I would go. The other resource that I would point you to is Judy Murray, Judy Murray has a wonderful program uh, for coordination and uh, for her for kids that she used with Andy and and Jamie and I, I think you can if you search it online you can you can find it. But what she did was which was really innovative is she she did all these agility coordination eye hand eye games in the house because she they didn't have a lot of money and they lived in uh, sound from, from what she said it sounded like they live in a small apartment or a small house and so she developed all these games around the house that you could do in the living room or in the kitchen uh things you could games you could do on a tabletop that are for developing the hand eye uh, of your children, so she she put it into a program, and I'd have to search the name of the program. But if you search Judy Murray coordination, uh, hand-eye coordination games, it might it, it should come up. And I think between Tony Nadal and Judy Murray, you've got your bases covered for developing for developing the the hand-eye coordination in young kids, and. Uh, 
Judy has some really cool uh, games that she does around the house with everyday household instruments, not even a racket, just household items. Um, I remember she, she did like some tabletop games and she would have the kids like when they're putting away the laundry, she'd have them like shooting, shooting laundry into a basket and working on their balance and stuff like that. So it, it's just a really cool resource. Uh, so I would point you to Judy Murray and Tony Nadal for, for coordination and um, uh, anything, uh, hand-eye coordination, especially for, for young kids. Great, great games and, and resources there. All right, who do we got? Who else do we got here watching? Jeffrey Hornsby, thank you for waving. Emerson Cruz, thank you so much. Jerry, I'm going to have a hard time pronouncing that last name, but I appreciate you guys tuning in. If you guys have any tennis questions, any development questions, this is my Sunday night q and I'm doing it on a Monday because I was traveling last night. And it's just basically an all-access show to a high-performance coach who can help answer your questions about raising your kids, developing your, your tennis players, general tennis questions, questions about technique or tactics, questions about junior development. Mohammed, Mohammed. Thanks for waving, buddy. Thanks for tuning in. Where are you guys from? Let me know. Appreciate you guys watching the show. If you have any tennis questions, let me know. I was talking about the Tony Nadal course. Really, too, really cool course. Have any of you guys checked it out? It's called World Mastery with Tony Nadal. It's a really awesome program. And he has a course for high-performance players. And he has a course for intermediate players. And he has a mentor course, but I think the mentor course for parents and for, for coaches who are interested in building character in their students is really special because Tony is a genius, and he, in my opinion, and he's, he's a philosopher, and he's a legend, and he talks about how to raise your kids well, how to build character, how to develop their tennis game, of course, which... I mean, to be honest, the, the, the tennis curriculum for the mentor course for young kids to me seems a little basic and maybe a little too traditional. You know, there's a lot of follow-throughs. Cool, Orlando. Jerry, cool, man. I love it down there. I come down to Lake Nona a lot to, to the USDA National Training Center. I love going down there and learning. Thanks for letting me know where you're at. If you have any tennis questions, let me know. If you have any questions about development or uh, junior development or any kind of general tennis questions, I'm, I'm, I'm available, guys. But what Tony's doing with, with the young kids is it's really basic. Like he's kind of has them following through to the neck, like very, you know, kind of, kind of, in my opinion, a little bit stiff follow throughs. And uh, some of the drills are interesting and, and curious to me, but. Uh, in general, the way that he wants the young kids to learn their technique seems to me very, very, very basic and pretty traditional. I don't, I'll even say it, it's a little old fashioned, you know, but I'm surprised that, that because he's doing a lot of cutting edge stuff and he's usually on, he's usually on uh, ahead of the curve in terms of his coaching, I'm talking about Tony Nadal, but some of that stuff for the young kids strikes me as pretty, pretty outdated, like... I don't teach any kids to follow through to the shoulder anymore. You know, if you watch my, my latest videos, we're working on uh, parabolic swing and, and inverting the racket on the follow through, inverting the racket on the finish, and trying to get that, that modern look to the forehand. And, you know, he's not doing any of that. He he's ha has all the kids kind of choking themselves up to the, to the neck. Uh, but... The, the character building stuff from Tony Nadal is just incredible. Like he's, he's, a, he's a guru for, for building the, just like, like the, the behavior and, and the work ethic and the values of your, of your kids and players. He's just, he's such a, he's such a philosopher on the subject and I think such a leader in, in setting standards for behavior and and the, the way a kid should act and and the values a kid should have. Great, Jerry, you got a question for me. This is what the show is all about. What's your take getting juniors to serve in volley? 
That's a great question. A lot of people say servant volley's dead. Do you mean for singles or for doubles? And do you mean that you, you, want, you want to teach them serve and volley or you want them to play the actual serve and volley style? Because I'm a big believer in teaching a kid to serve and volley, but I don't know that I would teach it as a main game style anymore. So maybe you could clarify that question and we could get into it a little bit. But I think all of your players should have a good volley. They should know how to serve and volley, especially for doubles especially if they're going to play college doubles. The, I still think the best place to be in doubles is at the net, but in singles, I'm not as convinced because in singles, the passing shots now are so good and the risk is high when you come to net in singles. So I have my reservations about making serve and volley a game style for my players. Uh, in singles, but in doubles, I'm a huge believer that when you have two players covering the net, the net's 36 feet wide, I think that's a clear advantage. Almost always you're at an advantage when you have two good volleyers at the net. So one of the things you can do is have kids play a lot of doubles and work on serve and volley in doubles. And I think playing doubles is one of the best ways to develop serve and volley. What's up, Corey Parr? Great coach and great player. It's nice to see you tuning in, bud. If you have a tennis question, shoot it out to me and let me know where you're, where you're coming from, where you're signing in from. Singles and doubles. Pick your position to come up or, Jerry, could you explain that again? You said pick your poise to come up, but I, did you mean position or did you mean something else? We had a question about whether you should teach kids uh, serve and volley and singles and doubles. I think for singles, it's not really necessary. You can develop a top player, a top national player, world, world, world-class world player without developing serve and volley. Uh, some kids are more talented at the net and they can develop that a lot easier. Also it depends on the kid and their personality. So that's, that's what I would say. I would say play a lot of doubles, serve and volley a lot in doubles. You know, some kids will play doubles and stay back. When, when the kids play doubles, teach them how to serve and volley within the doubles format. And, and you will see with some of the talented ones, they may, they may start working that into their singles game. Ah, pick your poison. Thanks, Jerry. Singles, I, I don't think it's necessary. If you have a kid with a really good serve and he has great hands and instincts at the net, then you can develop it a little more in singles. I just think in singles, you have to be careful that... If, if you're spending a lot of time on serve and volley, you know, that's taking away time that you could be working on something from the baseline, you could be working on the forehand weapon, you could be working on something else that might be critical. You could be working on movement. So there's an opportunity cost. You just have to be careful if you're doing a lot of serve and volley work, what is the opportunity cost? What, what are you forgetting to work on or taking time away from that, that, that might be essential for your student. So I would say go with doubles, serve and volley in doubles, work on, you know, work in that space because I think it's in doubles, the net is, is where it's at. In singles, it's a much dicier proposition, much more risky. I have written a lot lately that I think that when we get some uh, bigger athletic guys in the game in the future, I think we'll see serve and volley potentially come back in singles. So I don't know if you find that interesting, Jerry, but if we can get some guys like LeBron, you know, basketball size guys, 6'6", who can move well, I think it's possible to see the serve and volley return with a really explosive player who can serve huge and move well and who has good instincts at the net. So I think it's possible that the serve and volley will, could come back as even a game style in singles, but only with a certain type of athlete, a, a, a really special athlete with a monster serve and a very athletic movement at the net. I think it's, it's possible. And I sort of hypothesized that, you know, there may be some evolution in the volley technique too, where you may see more topspin volleys uh, rather than traditional slice volleys. I don't think we've seen a lot of evolution in the net game in terms of technique, technical evolution. So one of my personal beliefs is it's possible that, that if the volley technique could evolve to be better in the future, we might get 
some more serve and volley players, but it has to be someone, I think, really athletic and with a tremendous serve. The other thing is if the courts start to speed up again, we'll see more serve and volleyers. Right now, the courts are pretty slow on the professional circuit, and so it just doesn't pay off that much to come to net too often because you get burned by, by, the, by such, the guys are so good at passing. Uh, so that, that is kind of how I see it. It would be really cool to see serve and volley come back. I don't know if you guys realize, but I grew up as a serve and volley player. And later in my career, I learned to grind and play more Spanish style because I was traveling to Spain so much. I guess it became, uh, became important for me to, I realized that I, I was very limited as a pure, as a, a primarily a serve and volley player. So I grew up as a kid serving volley. And I saw Wimbledon on TV and I said, wow, I want to play like those guys. And I worked so much at the net. I developed a very good net game, but I, ne I think to some extent I neglected my backcourt game, which, which gave me limited tactical options. So I would just say if you're developing a player to be very careful and don't neglect the baseline, don't neglect the movement and the big forehand, those are so critical. The forehand as a weapon and the serve as a weapon. And the serve and volley itself is more of an adjunct and plays a supportive role. Unless you've got like a, a young LeBron who can do something really, really special and you're, you're trying to break the mold and come up with some, some new, you know, kind of a new game pattern. And I hypothesize that it might be a topspin volley. There might be, there might be a way to combine the serve with the big topspin, with a good topspin volley. And, and maybe you have some sort of new evolution in, in serve and volley game style. I think it's possible, but when you think about it, the net hasn't really evolved that much. I mean, what, what has evolved technically at the net? Not that much. The forehand's evolved, backhand's evolved. Serves evolved a lot, let's say the last 30 to 50 years, technically, but the volley is it's just, you know, very traditional in the way it's taught and the technique. I, I wonder if there's some out of the box way we could teach the volley with top spin, maybe with more swinging volley, uh, that, that and maybe even with a different grip structure. I've exper I, I thought about how you could change the grip structure at the net. So instead of using a continental grip, you could use a semi-Western grip at the net, and this is just some ideas that I have. I haven't really, haven't really done it with a top player yet, but I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested in trying it maybe with the talented kid. You know, uh, there's a way that you can hold the racket in a semi-Western grip, and it can be one grip for a backhand and forehand volley, and it could be a topspin volley. I think there's some maybe a cool evolution in the net technique that's possible there that no one's really. No one's really tried yet. I'm always looking for some new ways that we could teach technique or I'm looking for the future of, of technique in tennis. And I have friends who tell me it's never going to change, you know, the, the technique's going to stay the same. And, and I, I, just, I just like to challenge myself to think, try to think outside the box and think of, try to look at the, the technique of tennis in a different way than, than maybe other people are seeing it. But oh, those would be some ideas I have about serving volley. Johnny Pauls is watching. Thank you for waving. Let me know where you guys are signing in from. Ariel Tolo Aguirre. Did I get that right? Thank you for watching. Thank you for waving. Dix Yapi is watching. Probably butchered that pronunciation. I'm really sorry, buddy. But thank you for waving. Thank you for checking in. Let me know where you guys are checking in from. I'd like to learn where, where you guys are from. All right, Jerry has another question. How do you see rackets evolving in the next 10 years, even more powerful combined with strings? Yeah, you know, I'm not a technical guru. And I think the ITF is gonna set, is gonna set limits on what, what we can do with, with the technology. Oren Motovasil is watching. What's up, Oren? I haven't seen you in a while. Great, great player. Still battling it out. I have so much respect for you. Big shout out goes to Oren. Haven't seen you in a while. And I have a lot of respect for you because you are one of those guys who stays in, staying in shape, competing all the time. Like I really have so much respect for that. I'm the same way, still training, still playing. 
And I know how hard it is, especially as you get older. I know how hard it is to stay in shape and keep grinding. I have so much respect for you, buddy. Uh, we were talking about rackets and string. I, I think if, if the ITF... Yeah, what's up, man? It's great to hear from you. I think if the ITF, the ITF's going to limit the technology because if, if rackets and string get any better, it's just going to turn the game upside down. I mean, and potentially I mean, the guy, with the, the way the guys are serving now, I mean, there, it's a potential that the technology is going to uh, maybe not destroy the game, but alter the game in a way that no one, no one really wants the game to change. And I think so. That that's the big danger there with equipment. I, I'm sure that the ITF was going to. Ha they already have a lot of limits. You know, there's a certain size of the racket. The, the racket can't exceed certain dimensions or weight or the way it's strung. So I mean, I don't know uh, what's going to happen. I think one of the most interesting. Uh, racket technologies is like the double handed double handled racket like the natural racket i think that's really cool and some evolutions like that within the within this the limitations that the itf has are, are really interesting for me i'm really interested in double handed training in double forehand training i'm interested in in teaching kids two forehands both righty lefty uh, i'm interested in training ambidexterity so i think that's really interesting where the game may go in terms of ambidex Ambidex, ambidexterity training and I think some of the technology could support that like you see the double handled racket yeah 29 inches is the maximum length we we're talking about string too like what's going to happen with string and rackets I think any you know I, I don't know to me the the, the, the future is uh, these bigger more powerful guys and I'm, I'm waiting to see the next I'm waiting to see like a LeBron like a LeBron type athlete Maybe serve and volleying, you know, huge serve, 140, 150, huge kick serve, maybe more topspin volleys, you know. So for some of you out there who are asking me about serve and volley, like, I, I th that's the way I, I see it going. And the reason I say that is I asked my one of my mentors, Jose Higueras, probably you guys know Jose, uh, the Spanish coach who's, uh, con you know, he's, he's, a, he's a legend now. He worked with He worked with a lot of players on tour and He's been one of my mentors the last few years, and, and he, he, that's what he told me. He, I asked him the same question, and he said, well, I think if serving volley is going to come back, it's going to be with someone really athletic, really powerful, and, 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 I, and I agree with him. I, that made sense to me. Like, if it's going to come back, it's got to be with a really special athlete. So I was just saying maybe like a LeBron-type athlete and maybe some type of technical evolution in the volley that no one's really... No one's really done yet. But the volley's just stagnant. It's it's it is what it is for so long with the uh, one one continental grip. You know, I have a few ideas with the semi-western grip that I want to sort of try. I maybe I don't have the guts to try it on a kid. I, you have to try it with someone. And you know, I'd love to get a talented kid and sort of play around with it a little bit. But I, I got to get the guts to do it. Uh, step out. Step out and into traffic and try not to get hit by a bus by trying something new. I, I really believe in ambidexterity, you know, training ambidexterity. I would like to develop more players with two forehands, and I would like to develop more players with two serves, lefty-righty serves. So lefty-righty forehand, lefty-righty serves. That's really kind of what I've, I've been thinking about doing, and I just haven't found the right candidate to do it yet. And i got to get some crazy parents who are willing to try it with me, but, you know... All right, we've got some buddies on here. Brian Kusher, an old friend. What's up, buddy? Lisa Acevedo, waving at me. Thank you so much. Thank you for waving. When you, when you, sign, when you check in, let me know where, where you're coming from, like what part of the world you're coming from, because I like to know. It's cool to see where the audience is at. Brian says coaches don't train the volley enough with juniors. I don't know, man. I'm gonna have to disagree with you there. I'm sorry, buddy. But for old times' sake, I'm 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 just gonna say, all I can say is I see a lot of volley volleys being taught. Maybe it's not being taught that well, but a lot of the kids that come to me from the local clubs, they're doing a lot of volley. I mean, every, at least in New York. Maybe in your area it's different, but in my part of the woods, in New York City and in, in the area. Around here in the Northeast United States, it's a lot of volley being taught. 
And my opinion, I see way too much volley being taught. I see players being taught a lot of volley and a lot of attacking the net, and they're not even solid from the backcourt. Or they have a lot of movement problems. They don't move well. They have poor footwork, poor balance, poor foot skills, and they and their coach is spending a lot of time with the net with them. I think that's a, a mistake in prioritization. You know, I, I think when a kid is, especially when a kid's young, you got to get the movement right. You have to get them solid from the back, and then you can start working on uh, working up at the net in transition. But I think it's a, I think it's a mistake to start a kid at the net and do a lot of uh, do a lot of work with the volley when they're not solid or they don't have good movement skills. And that's, I guess that's where I'm coming from, Brian. Not to shoot, uh, shoot you down there, but, you know. All right, so Brian's a college coach. He says he doesn't see a lot of kids who know how to volley. Huh. Yeah. That, I've heard that from other college coaches, so you're, not, you're definitely not alone in that sentiment. You're definitely not alone. A lot of college coaches do say that. So I guess that sort of alters my analysis. I see my mom is watching. Thanks for waving, Mom. It's great to see you. Doing the Sunday Q&A with Chris, but it's Monday because I was traveling on, on Sunday. Let me know where you're coming from, where, where are you checking in from. Are you in Utah? Let me know where you are. I'd like to see where the audience is from. It's cool for me to see uh, to answer questions from around the world. So Brian is saying a lot of college coaches see players who don't know how to volley. And you're right about that, Brian. You're right. I hear that from a lot of college coaches. Yeah, I, I guess in, there's, there's pockets of uh, programs that, that spend a lot of time grinding, and they don't, they don't develop good skills at the net. That's definitely true. Kids aren't playing a lot of doubles. A lot of kids aren't playing doubles. So that can be part of it. You know, when, when kids are playing a lot of dubs, I think you're going to end up with pretty good volleyers and good instincts up there. So I don't even know if we have to teach it more, but we got to get the kids playing. If you want a good volleyer, you get them into some doubles action, and they will definitely start to develop the, some of the skills that you need. You have to get them, at the, get them up at the net and encourage them to move and poach and stuff like that and serve and volley. I was just saying that earlier, how you definitely want, you want players to, to uh, learn to serve and volley, but I think doubles is the best place to teach serve and volley, best place to teach, best place to teach volleys, great place to teach return to serve is, is in doubles as well. So, you know, that, that's what I could say. I know, huh, I, I, I know a lot, a lot of clubs that I, I, I have kids from a lot of clubs in New York, and they're, they're doing a lot of stuff with the moving forward to the net. And maybe it's not, you're not seeing it at the college level. That's a good, that's a good question. Maybe there's some other college coaches that could sign in. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, because I grew up, I know how to volley because my, my dad started me backwards. You know, he started me at the net and I learned the whole game in reverse, which I think is, to be honest, I think it's wrong. I think the way that I learned how to play tennis it's not a good way to learn tennis, where, where I learned how to serve big and go to the net. And then only later on did I start to learn, you know, I traveled, trained and traveled in Spain, I learned how to grind. And I think generally you want to develop players the opposite way. You want to teach them how to be uh, solid and know how to grind well. And then, and then in, at some point on down, the, down the road, you develop the, the volley as a supplement uh, or a complement to to the baseline game, and I think the way I learned it was, I I think it was very anxiety pro, uh, provoking because when you, when you're not solid from the baseline, I think it it creates a lot of anxiety in your games, and I I don't know how certain volleyers sleep at night because it's a very risky way to play, and it's a very high stress way to play, and everything has to be pinpoint and perfect. You got to serve perfect. You got to volley pinpoint to win nowadays. And I think I started feeling that as I got older, I started feeling that, man, this, this is a servant volley. I have to play perfect every day. And you can do it some days, but can you do it consistently and reliably? And now I'm much happier because I can stay back and hit big forehands or I have some options to grind if necessary. 
and I can still go to the net. I, I, I like the all-court game better than uh, limited just serve and volley. But yeah, I think, like you said, a lot of a lot of places are not teaching the volley and the instincts and the movement up there very well. And there are some places that are that are teaching a lot of grinding and they don't encourage doubles. So if a kid comes out of, a, you know, every club is different. If a kid comes out of a club or an academy that doesn't believe in playing a lot of doubles or doesn't, doesn't do any work at the net, you're going to get kids like that in college who, who can't, you know, who you're going to have to spend a lot of time with teaching. A lot of coaches do that. A lot of college coaches bring in kids from, you know, Argentina or Spain, and maybe they haven't done a lot of network, and they, they spend the freshman and sophomore year teaching them how to volley. And, and by junior or senior year, they got a pretty comprehensive player there. A lot, a lot of college coaches do that. You know, I have a friend from Argentina who, who did that at TCU. And, you know, had, it's really cool when you see a guy who can grind, who also has got sweet hands at the net. And that's a really cool, it's really cool to see the complete game like that. To me, that's the ideal, to get that complete game. And whether you want to start a kid at net or start a kid from the baseline, I, I think you should start a kid, get them solid from the baseline and s start there. You know, that, to me, that's, that's the best place to start. And then you can, if the kid has some ability, you can work more at the net. And I would encourage a lot of doubles, you know, a lot, play a lot of doubles and, and spend time learning the skills there. But, yeah. Yeah, Jerry's asking me if I'm in New York. Right now I'm in Londonderry, Vermont. I have a club here. This is my home away from New York. Uh, this is my my paradise in the mountains. I have a tennis club here, so I'm holding a camp here. So I'm traveling right now in Vermont. But I live in New York City, and I coach in New York City as well. So I'm sort of, I sort of bounce back and forth. Anytime I can get out of New York City and get to the mountains, I try to get up here because I like the peace and quiet up here, and I, I like the mountains and the fresh air and... I like I like nature here. It's really really beautiful. It's very it's very idyllic here in the mountains. And I, there are things that I love about New York, but New York is kind of a stressful place, and uh, it's too much traffic. And I, I I lived I grew up in New York, and I, I live in New York all the time. So I, I'm always looking to get out and and get away. But then sometimes I want to come back and go to nice restaurant or go to a museum or something. So New York has some amazing things, but uh, for me, I'm, I'm happy. I'm my, probably my happiest when I'm up here in Vermont in the peace and quiet, and I'm looking for peace in my life. I don't need too much chaos in, in New York City anymore. Uh, maybe when I was younger, I needed more of the adrenaline rush of New York City, but now, now I just, uh, I, I, I'm looking for peace, peace in the mountains. 21st of December, yeah, I'm there. I'm there if you have a player that you want to bring. I, I have kids come from all over to New York to train with me. I just had a girl in from Missouri, from Kansas City, a uh, national level girl. I have kids come in all the time. Uh, they, they can work with me in New York City area. So yeah, if you can't get to Vermont, a lot of people want to come visit New York and then they, they schedule like a, a trip to New York and also training with me. So I have people doing that. And, you know, guys, it's been a good discussion. If you have any uh, other questions about tennis, let me know. Brian, it's a really good question about uh, volleys. I hope I, I hope I did some, some, gave some decent answers to that. But, you know, you, you make a good point. There are some programs, I'm sure there are pockets of programs around the country that don't teach the volley very much. But I, I guess in New York here, I'm seeing a lot of the opposite. I see a lot of players who are coming to me, at least from our local clubs, who are doing a lot of volley and uh, approach stuff when the kids are not even that solid or they don't have good racket speed with the forehand or they, they have movement flaws. And to me, I rather, to me, I, I want better racket speed with the forehand. I want really good movement and I'll take those things over a good volley any day. Uh, so I guess that's just the way I'm seeing it locally. Uh, but you're right. You're right. I think I think uh, the best way to teach double uh, volley is maybe not to teach it too much and make the have the kids play a lot of doubles. Teach it a little, but let the kids learn in doubles. I think that to me that's the most efficient way to to get uh, to teach the volley. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the 
the compliment. Uh, November 21. Ah, November 21, I think I might be in Vermont on vacation with my family. Uh, that's a good question. Why don't you just email me or text me? You have my information. If you go online, just go to chrislewitt.com. Or you can email me, chris at chrislewitt.com. Or my number is 914-462-2912 if you want to text me. That's, everybody text me there. Text is the best way to get a hold of me. If you text me, 914-462-2912 or chris at chrislewitt.com. I answer lots of questions via email. I have coaches and parents who email me all the time from all over the place. and I answer all those questions for free. And I answer them personally, which I think is cool because at the end of the day, I just want to help those kids who are out there. So if there's any questions you have about your kids, let me know. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I gave you a different perspective, Brian, but like I said, I think it depends on the club. Some clubs are teaching volley. Some clubs are not. If your player is coming from a different country where they don't do a lot of volley work, you're going to have some work to do. Like, you know, if they're, they grew up in Spain grinding or they're in uh, Argentina grinding, they probably haven't done much work at the net and you got to find out if they played doubles or not if the kid hasn't played a double the kids played like two doubles tournaments in their whole junior career though that's probably not a good sign for their volleys the kids played 50 doubles tournaments or something you know that that you know you can have a kid who can play up there Brody Queel thanks for signing on thanks for checking in let me know where you guys are from i'm interested where the audience is from I like to answer questions from people all over the world. Yesterday I had a guy, a friend from the Philippines and from Australia. It's fun to see the, when people are, are checking in from far away. Brian, you have any other tennis questions on your mind? Let me know. I'll do that. And then oh, we're doing pretty good on time. I, I, uh, I like to spend time on, it's supposed to be Sunday night, but Monday night we go go a little longer. And and uh, try to answer in more, more in depth. You know, I have a morning show where I do a Q&A, but it's a lightning round, so I do, uh, so I do some quick answers. But this uh, Sunday night program, today is Monday night, I try to get into some long uh, explanations and maybe more musings, you know, more, I guess some people might say more rambling, but more in-depth discussion and more philosophy than, than on my Monday morning then on my morning show, but yeah, does anyone, anyone out there, yeah, does anyone think the servant volley is coming back? Yeah, that's, that's the question I asked Jose Higueras, and he's, he's one of the smartest guys I know in, in tennis, and he's been my greatest, probably my greatest mentor of the last few years. I, I go out to Palm Springs to study with him, and he actually lets me call him when I have development questions or training questions with my players, so I actually use him as a resource. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Like when, I, when I'm working with a kid and I'm not quite sure if what I'm doing is right, which is, which I, I, always wanna, I always wanna check myself, you know, before I wreck myself or wreck a player. So he's one of the first guys I call, you know. I, I will call Jose and ask him like his take on things, not about technical things, because he's not really a technician, but I will ask him about the state of the game or uh, a question like that about what's happening with serve and volley. He's the, he's the guy, you know, for me, he's got so much wisdom. And that's what he told me. He said, it's possible it will make, it will come back. But with a very athletic, big, powerful guy uh, or girl, you know, so that, that's what I would tell you. Uh, Jerry, thanks so much. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you tuning in. And uh, we do this every Sunday night. So today's Monday, but uh, Sunday evening. So I work all weekend doing my thing on the court. And then on Sunday night, I like to jump on online and do a, and, and go live and just, you know, check in with like lots of coaches and parents around the, the country and the world. It's so, so cool about this platform is you can answer questions and talk with folks from not just your area, but people that are all over, all over the planet. And it's such a great medium to, to sort of explore different ideas and have a good discussion like that. 
yeah. So if there's anyone who has any more questions, uh, let me know. Tennis questions. Thanks for the thumbs up, buddy. I appreciate that. I will, I will hang on a, a few minutes longer. I'm hoping to get more, you know, my passion is for young kids. So I really like to develop an audience with parents who have a player, have a junior. And I spend so much time helping parents make good, good decisions for their kids. And I think that's so important not to, not to screw up your, your young tennis player. So I'm hoping that as the show grows, that we can get a lot of parents, especially parents with young children, so I can help all those children out there, uh, help their parents maybe not screw them up too much, not, not make a mistake. And because so many parents come to me and they're like, Chris, you know, should I do this or should I try this or is this right? And, and I think that's really where I want to help. I want to help a lot of the kids out there who maybe don't have access to uh, uh, high level coaching, you know, or, and maybe their, their parents just were never tennis players and they want to learn. That's one thing I really want to do more of. So please share with any parents that, you know, uh, share this program as a resource. So Brian is asking me. Can tennis attack the big athletic athletes like LeBron? They tend to play other sports, right? Right. So my feeling is that, and I, I've thought about this project a lot. I really think that if we got into the, if we got into the inner cities, if we got into uh, urban areas that have uh, a lot of good athletes who are who are not doing so well financially and and most of those guys are playing are they're playing basketball you know they're, they're playing basketball maybe they're playing football and they're not even considering tennis and i just think if we got some of those inner city if we had a program to recruit some of those those amazing athletes who are turning to basketball and we got them into tennis if, if you gave me a hundred athletes from a program like that I guarantee you I'd have a bunch of players in the top 100 competing for slams. I, I absolutely believe that. If you, if you gave me 20 of them, give me 10 of them. Give me 10 or 20 athletes, uh, LeBron-style athletes, who normally would play basketball. Because basketball is cheap and it's so readily available in the cities, in the urban areas, you know, you just go play basketball down the street. And tennis is just, parents won't even consider tennis. And, 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 uh, especially families that don't have a lot of money, they won't even consider tennis because tennis is too expensive to play. So my feeling is for those, for, for, w there needs to be a program to get those athletes into tennis and it has to be sponsored by somebody. Somebody's got somebody to pay for the training and for the equipment and, and all that stuff when, when those athletes are at the age, maybe under 10 under 12, when they're still deciding on what sport they're going to play, what sport they're going to love, and get some of those really good, I'm talking like, you know, 6'6 six, six to 6'10, six, who can move well, jump well, powerful athletes. If, those are the kind of players that I want. If I, you give me 20 of those guys, give me them at like 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever, 11, 12, and let me work with them for a bunch of years just let me build their foundation and then we send them out into the junior circuit itf and they go pro we're going to get some bunch of guys top 100 we're going to get potential grand slam winners competitors for com competitors for grand slams straight out of the u.s but the problem is most of the most of the kids from the u.s who are choosing tennis they're, they're not the best athletes that's the issue and i think that's what you're getting at Brian, I think that's what you're sort of suggesting. You know, how, how do we get those athletes? But my point is they're not playing because it's too expensive. They're, they're always going to choose basketball or football or, you know, even a sport like baseball, traditional American sports that are cheap. And, and they have a better economic return. Like the, the, the value proposition to play basketball is much better than tennis because – you get a nice salary as a basketball player. You're like, what's the league minimum for basketball? I mean, it's probably a pretty good salary. You get, you don't have to play the whole year. It's, you know, it's a season sport, so you get some time off, and you have some job security if you get injured, 
And it's really cheap to learn and play. You just play in your local neighborhood and all of the coaching is provided by your school. So when, when, that, when that is, uh, thank you for the thumbs up, Oscar Montanez. Thank you, buddy. Thanks for the wave. Let me know where you're from. Give me a shout out. Tell me where you're checking in from. I'd be curious to know. But my point is that how can you get one of those athletes to play tennis? No, no, no family in their right mind would take their really talented athlete and play tennis from the inner city. It just doesn't, I mean, just the cost of buying rackets and string alone is a deal breaker. It's a deal breaker. And I've, I, mean, I put a lot of thought into this. I, I, I wrote, I wrote, I actually wrote up some proposals for this for maybe for the, for maybe some organizations like maybe USTA. I, I threw out some, some thoughts about this. I, I put it down on paper, I guess, a while back and I never really got anywhere, but I, I guess you sort of made me think, uh, you made me, you made me remember, Brian, you made me remember what, uh, what, what I, I spent some time, uh, kind of a proposal that I was thinking about because I wanted, I would love to get those athletes. Like if there's anyone out there who wants to do it, send put them in touch with me because I really think if we had, I think size is, size is a huge advantage, you know, just in general. I know a lot of people say, oh, you got to be 6'1 or 6'2. And, uh, you know, and that, that's that all the historically, all the top players have been that height. But I, mean, I, I just don't, I guess I just don't believe it. I, I think when you get a really good mover above 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, who's powerful, it's, it's huge. It's, it's, it's huge. And you can transcend the dimensions of the court. I think you can transcend the, the geometry of the court, the dimensions of the court. The, the game wasn't designed dimensionally to be played by an athlete that big and that explosive. So I think that kind of athlete can transcend the game and maybe bring back serve and volley. That, that's sort of what I see. And so you get a, you know, you get a guy like Isner size, but doesn't move, but moves a lot better than Isner. Anyone between 6'6 six, six and 6'10 six, who can really move and who's, who is explosive and has good coordination. Cause sometimes those big guys don't have the best coordination, you know, they're a little, they're a little limited in terms of their, their hand, eye, maybe their, their, their agility, you know? So if you get a big athlete who's very agile and explosive, I just think it's an, it's an incredible combination. But my point is you can't get those guys to play because they're all going to choose basketball or, or one of the other traditional American sports because they're, those sports are cheap. They're cheap. And their parents would be out of their mind to steer their kids towards tennis from the inner city out of their mind because they could never, they could never even afford it. You know, they need a scholarship. There needs to be a scholarship for those kids. They need to be sponsored. And then you could lure them out of, out of basketball and into tennis. And we could have, have so many guys competing for top, uh, top hundred, you know, who are really, really special athletes. But right now we got a lot of, a lot of kids who, I mean, I, I don't want to say it. I mean, I, I think you know where I'm going. You know, you got, you got a lot of kids who are not that athletic. They're from the suburbs. They're from a wealthy family. And, those are, uh, and they're decent athletes. They'll make good college players. And those are the kids who are all over the top 100 in the USDA rankings. Top, you know, all of the, a lot of those national ranked kids at the top of the USDA are kind of country club kids good athletes, but not great. You know, they're not the cream of the crop athletes. Family's got a lot of money for sh to ship them around and get enough points to get in the top 100 in the country. And that's not really going to do it on the world level to compete for Grand Slams or top 100. So, I mean, this is something I thought about a lot because I have a whole reality show where I'm, I'm searching for the next American champion, uh, trying to build a top 100 player, someone competing for a Grand Slam. And I, I see that as an incredible asset that we have. We have a lot of athletes from the inner city, a lot of athletes from uh, under, underprivileged uh, backgrounds, and we need to get them into tennis. But the only way to get them into tennis is they need to know that they don't have to pay. Because if they say they have, if the parents say they have to pay, they're like, forget it. You know, we're just going to play basketball. You know, forget it. I don't know what you guys think about that, agree or disagree, but. 
I see it pretty clearly, and it wouldn't take that much when you consider the budget that USDA has and the millions of dollars that they're using for, like, you know, you see how much the new, the new roof on Arthur Ashe costs or, you know, or, or Armstrong, or you see how much the U.S. Open's bringing in, and you could take a small amount on that budget. Jerry's saying, like, 500 grand, whatever it is. You could take a very small amount of that USDA money and put it into an inner city program to pay and do a talent ID and grab the tallest, highest jumping, most agile kids, boys and girls under 10 and just, and just supplement them and tell their parents that everything's taken care of. They don't have to play basketball. We'll pay for the sticks. We'll pay for the balls. We'll pay for the string. We just want your kid to play tennis. And then the U.S. has a shot, you know, has a shot to have a lot of world dominant players. But the way it is right now, we have so many kids coming out of the suburbs and country clubs, and they're just not the best athletes. Some of them are fierce competitors. I've had a lot of kids like that. You know, I had a lot of good national rank kids, great kids. I love working with them, but they're not world class athletes. You know, they're not, they're not. They're not like a LeBron. You're not like a Michael Jordan. You're not like a, uh, you know. And, and usually, I, 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 I'm thinking. Uh, bat, I like the basketball athletes. When I watch ESPN Sports, or I watch like Sports Center, and I see the basketball athletes, I, I think they're the ideal athlete to recruit for tennis. Not the football players so much, not the, not, not the baseball players, the basketball players, the, the, really, the really mobile, powerful basketball players. When I, when I see those guys, I think, man, those are the kids I want to coach. I want to coach those kids when they're like six or seven or eight or nine or 10 or, or under 12. I, just get, I want to get those types of athletes. And I never see them. I see them once in a blue moon. I see them very rarely because why? Because there's no, the value proposition for those families is, is there's, no, there's no payoff for, for playing tennis. It's too risky financially. It's, it, it would be financial suicide to try to play tennis from, the, from those families' perspectives. So we never get, we never dip into that, into that uh, gene pool, you know, into that DNA. We need that, that, we need that athletic DNA. We need a lot of it because it's not a guarantee. You need a bunch of those athletes and then they're going to push each other and get to the top. And to me, that would solve the American tennis issue right there. You know, that would, that would make a huge impact. Uh, so that, that's how I see it. Francie Pep, thanks for watching. Give me a shout out. Let me know where you guys are checking in from. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Let me know where you're tuning in from. Jerry says, there's so much money at the top for winners and majors versus the first round loser. The money at the top of the game is unbelievable. Uh, but yeah, the, this is a major problem in tennis. Everyone's talking about how, how do we get more money for the lower ranked guys. And I, I agree, it should be more equitable. But I, I still, getting back to those, those, uh, those families, the poor, you know, relatively... Uh, poor families, a lot of the urban families, the inner city families, they, they don't want to play tennis. How, if we can just figure out how to get those families in tennis and get some of those LeBron, uh, Michael Jordan type athletes in tennis, I mean, then we really got something. You, you, get, a, you get a group together there and, and train them with a good coach. I'd love to do it. I would do it. I would sign up for that. It's basically like a, um, like a pet project. Um, it could be a USDA project. USDA could throw some cash into that. It wouldn't be that much for them to do that. And, 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 you, would get a, and you would get a superstar coming out, of, coming out of one of the inner cities, coming out of New York City, coming out of Detroit, coming out of wherever. And there's, we have a lot of big urban areas in the U.S. and very few tennis players, good ones are coming. Very few kids in those areas are choosing tennis. That's my point. They're all coming from the suburbs. Nelly Gibson, what's up? Thanks for tuning in. 
Uh, it's really cool to see you following me sometimes. And and uh, how are you guys? You guys moved out of my area. I'm so sad. How's everything going? Uh, how's Juliana doing? I miss working with her. She is probably getting older now. In my mind, she's just a young, young kid, but maybe she's... Is she off to college yet, or how, how old is Juliana now? It's good to hear from you guys. So before I sign off, does anyone have any other tennis questions, tennis-related questions? It's been a fun discussion. I didn't know we would get into this discussion about uh, American tennis and building American champions, but you know, I guess Brian, Brian got my mind racing, got my mind working on that. And I, I have done a lot of write, I've done some writing and thought on that in the past. So it just sort of, it's sort of, uh, I guess it hit a nerve with me, but why can't we just get some of those basketball players playing tennis? That, that would solve a lot of problems. You know, it would, it would make, it would make uh, the U.S. Have a, have a chance. It would give us a really good chance to compete at a dominant level internationally again, because we have the athletes, we have them but they're not playing tennis. They're not choosing tennis. And rightly so. When you just think about it, his family sitting over the dinner table and the kid says, well, tennis is cool, but I'm gonna go play basketball. And the parent says, well, how, how much does each one cost? And well, tennis, I gotta buy all this equipment and I gotta pay for travel to these tournaments. And the parent's like, forget it, forget all that. Just go play, go shoot some hoops down the street with your buddies. You know, and the school will take care of all the tournaments for basketball and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's how I see it. Gosh, could we just get a project like that going? And I, will, I, will, I would volunteer my time to train a group of really talented athletes uh, who are tall, like big, big athletes. I don't know the name, you know, I don't know how, to, you know, tall, agile, and explosive over 6'6". Six, six. They have to be predicted to be over 6'6 six, six in height, and we have to test them out, you know, get like Mark Kovacs to test their, their agility and, all, and do a whole, uh, you know, movement analysis on them and, and make sure that they're, they have a high level of movement and they're really big. Yeah. Yeah, Jerry says tennis is a straight commission job. It's a, it's a very risky job, isn't it? You know, that, that's the thing. You, you, we, we want those kids to play tennis, but they can get a nice, cushy salary job on a basketball team, making league minimum, and they're doing pretty well. They got benefits. They get injured. The team takes care of them. Tennis is crazy. The, the financial setup for tennis is just not very good, is it? So anyway... I don't think solving that, that the money at the top level is going to help get basketball-sized athletes in the sport. I think, I think a direct, a direct scholarship program, a direct sponsorship program is the way to go. It's the way we have to do it. We have to actually go into the go into the big cities, the urban areas, and recruit, recruit talent ID those those kids. Find the ones that that say, oh, tennis. That sounds interesting. I never thought about playing tennis before. How much does it cost? Oh, we'll take, you're going to take care of all the costs? Then you might be able to convince a parent to do it. But if not, you know, no parent's going to, going to sign that deal. They're not going to sign up for that. They're not going to sign up for tennis. Basketball, football, baseball, you know. All right, guys, it's getting late. I need to sign off and... I'm going to watch Ant-Man and the Wasp with my son. It's going to be fun. Looks like a good movie. So they got, uh, Ant-Man's got, got uh, a lot of agility. That's what I need. I need some athletes with agility. He can get pretty big, too. I need some big athletes with a lot of agility. And then we can bring Serve and Volley back. Okay, guys? All right. I'm going to see, see you guys on the next show. We do this every Sunday night. Today is Monday. It's not Sunday. I'm sorry, I was traveling last night, but I will be back next Sunday for the Sunday Q&A with Chris. And it's been fun. It's been a really interesting discussion, actually. Uh, I think about the volley. Is anyone with me? Is it possible to evolve the technique of the volley? Anyone 
think outside the box, people. How do we, the volley hasn't changed very much. What can we do up there? Like the way Agassi was doing it. He started doing that swing and volley. Maybe he was on to something there. Uh, if you like the show, please uh, hit the like button. Please share with your friends, especially parents. I would like to get more parents in the audience. I would like to get more parents asking me for help with their kids. I love, my, my mission in life is to help, to really help kids, kids around the world. I want to help more kids to be successful and to be healthy and happy. And I can do that through the medium of tennis, through the, vent, through the vehicle of tennis. And so, so like, share, and subscribe. If you, it, this will all, these shows all get archived onto YouTube. So you can go to my YouTube channel, just search Chris Lewitt. Go to my YouTube channel, you can catch all the shows there. Uh, like, share, and subscribe. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks for the support. I'll see you guys on the next show. Stephen Fitzpatrick, sorry, buddy, I got to sign out. But shoot me an email or let's catch up. I'm still going over to Hackley once in a while. I'll see you over there, buddy. All right, have a good night, everyone.